um, a bureaucracy. Well, uh, first thing first, uh, next week uh, there's the uh, meeting uh, and we won't have the head seminar. So we're going to uh, see uh, back in uh, um, two weeks, right? Okay. And then the other thing is that uh, a good chunk of the organizing committee of the head seminar will be stepping out. So um, I encourage young researchers in particular to, to step in and start doing this. Uh, um, like volunteer yourself, or you're gonna be volunteered at a certain point by by someone. Um, okay. Uh, so without further ado, the speakers of today. Today we have. Uh, okay. <laughs> so today we're gonna have. Only if you can see the wife are you doing other um Victorian institution. Okay. So the first speaker of today is uh, Stephen Lesage. Lesage? Okay. Um he is a PhD candidate at Space Science at the University um, of Alabama in Huntsville, working with uh, uh, Michael Briggs at the Permedia GBM team. Uh, his primary research focuses um, is on gamma ray burst and crop emission, okay, with secondary interest in terrestrial gamma ray flashes and terrestrial electron beams. And uh, the title of his talk today is going to be Permit GBM Analysis of the Vault, uh, which is the brightest of all time, um, uh, gamma ray burst 221098. This is yours. Thank you, man. Uh, All right. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna warn you. Um, what's up? Hello. Just good. Um, yeah. I guess this is good. Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna hold it like a microphone. Okay. Um. So I'm Stephen the Sage. Uh, this is the Fermi GBM analysis of the brightest gamma ray burst of all time. All right, we're back. So first, I have to talk about what Fermi GBM is because that's what's affecting this thing. Um, so it is. Uh, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has the Large Gamma Ray Telescope on top, and the GBM uh, Gamma Ray Burst Monitor is 12 sodium iodide detectors and two bismuth ceramide detectors that range from 8 keV up to 40 MeV, and that extends that range up to 300 keV. Um, we mainly use the GBM NAI and BGO detectors and the LLE low energy lab photon. So what is a gamma ray? Um, it's the largest explosion in the universe. Uh, there is the central engine typically forming into a black hole. There's the prompt emission and the afterglow. So as the ejector comes out, um, there will be a bow shock at the front when the uh, relativistic jet interacts with the interstellar medium. And that is the beginning of the afterglow. And within the jet, you can have these internal shocks, um, which forms the prompt emissions. So the prompt emission, these internal shocks are in gamma rays. And this afterglow um, actually is in gamma rays all the way, it can be measured all the way down to the radiant. Um, and there are two sources that typically generate these gamma ray bursts. The shorter gamma ray bursts, so uh, from binary neutron star mergers, like 1728-17a, the gravitational wave gamma ray burst coincident event. Um, and the longer gamma ray bursts, so more than two seconds, are typically from core collapse supernova. And that's what we'll get into with this time. So why are we going to talk about this one specific gamma ray burst? Well, this animation shows the, the light curve of the gamma ray burst 
and the four other brightest gamma ray bursts that GBM had seen in 15 years. And it very clearly stands out. It's clearly brighter and it's it's honestly just ridiculous. So this is the light curve. Notice the log scale, because if it wasn't log scale, you wouldn't be able to see these, these features. Uh, I'm going to talk about this triggering pulse out here. Then returns to background. You have the main prompt emission, and then this very smooth afterglow, which I will get into how we found that. Is. But it's smooth over here, and then there's this dip around 1,500 seconds. That's Earth occultation. So we stop seeing the event because Earth gets in the way. So we were lucky enough to see 13, I guess 14 or 1500 seconds of this event, which is really fantastic. Um, before the triggering pulse, we searched with our sub-threshold searches and found no emission from this event. So we caught it exactly when it turned off. Furthermore, the first few seconds of the event, the highest energy photons arrived first. So when this thing turned on, it turned on in the highest energy right away, which is atypical for a gamma ray burst because typically when the afterglow turns on is when you have those higher energy photons and that happens after the prompt emission stops. So this is atypical, but it has been seen in another event, 13 and 427 a If you can remember that animation at the beginning, it's the second burst. So, and that was also in the triggering pulse. So this is something to look into further. And then we took that triggering pulse and we looked at the spectra of it. And it was best fit either by a multicolored black body or a compromised spectrum, which is a cutoff power loss. And actually, if you take the multicolored black body equation and you set M equal to one, it doesn't matter what that is, but you recover the compromised spectrum. So this all makes sense. M was very close to one in this case. But this basically just shows that that triggering pulse was thermal. So it comes from, it can explain by uh, thermal emission and the EP was about 15 MeV, which is extremely high. Um, so if we take this equation in uh, our, the theorist Chris Fryer, um, we looked into this being shock breakout, which is as these stars exploded uh, in the core collapse, so the core of the star collapses first uh, before the outer shells or the, you know, the radius of the star nodes is collapsed. And there will be a shock propagating through the star that can produce these photons. And then as the star begins to explode, there, it becomes optically thick and the photons are shut off. And then there's an impact emission, which explains it going back to background before it really turns off. So this is a little kind of how that works. But this being shock breakout and the 15 MEV peak really pushes the limit of shock breakout. Theorists aren't too happy about that. Um, but we can, Take the T min, which is the minimum variability time scale. I have a backup slide on that if you care. We get this value, we get the, the gamma from shock breakout, and Z is the redshift, which was measured. Put it into this equation, and we get a rough estimate for the radius of the star. And that radius is consistent with a Wolf Rx star, which is what you would expect for a core class supernova. So our measurements and the equation, everything itself is consistent, which is really just nice to hear when you're doing data analysis and you agree with the theory that it should be. Getting into the prompt emission now, and we're going to ignore these gray regions because that's where we had pulse pile up and data saturation. Um, we cut it into different time scales, basically. And in each chunk, it was best fit by a band function. Doesn't really matter what that is. It's an empirical function. But, you know, it can explain some synchrotron radiation, things like that. But the, the take home is that it's non thermal we have this thermal triggering pulse and a non-thermal bulk of the prompt emission. So there's this transition from thermal to non-thermal. Further support of the breakout theory. And then the other thing we can look at is right after this bad time interval, in this chunk right here, with my hands shaking the perfect amount, um, it wasn't just fit by a band function. It was fit by a, a band function plus this power law, which the power law index is two. I know everyone's shocked right now because you all know what that means. We believe this to be the onset of the afterglow. But we still need to prove that. But this is consistent with the onset of afterglow 
being in the superposition of the approximation. So trying to isolate this last part as afterglow, we took a little bit of what we know to be prompt emission and this extended smooth part thought to be afterglow. Um, and we fit the time series with a Norris function, which is just, it's, it's a pulse fit function for prompt emission. So we fit it with two Norris functions and a smooth power law. And then we can take that power law and put it into the equation of the afterglow basically, which is two power laws combined. And we have this, which we measured up here. Oh, I'm sorry. If we take this power law and extrapolate it down um, and use some earth occultation techniques that Colinos and Hodge did, I don't really understand it. But our power law decay is consistent with what Swift and Bat measured. So we're confident that this is the correct power law. So taking that power law and the um, the equation for an afterglow, we can get this power law up here by either assuming it is the interstellar medium or it is the um, part of the star matter, basically, the, the wind of the star. Um, and it, it's best fit by the interstellar medium, and then we can get where this peak is if we constrain this, that the power or the afterglow can't be more than the prompt emission. So this is, we know this purple line is the brightest it's going to be, so the afterglow can't be brighter than that, so that's what we measure. So we get this peak of the afterglow um, around 280 seconds, which before we measured the afterglow right around that same time. So we, in our paper when we published it, we kind of intuitively guess that this is the peak of the atmosphere. And after our paper came out, Lasso published their paper measuring the afterglow directly, and it lines up exactly where we thought it would be. So we were able to decouple the prompt emission and afterglow correctly, and we have evidence of that with a direct measurement of the afterglow, which is really cool. Kind of not guessing, but intuitively intuitively guessing that this is where we're going to find it and that's actually where we found it, which is really nice. Lastly, we're going to get to these two grayed out regions, the, the bad time intervals where we have data saturation. This is the pulse pileup correction. So the there's artificial flat top in here. You can see where it just gets flat. That's the maximum data rate that the, the hardware can handle. So this is for all you hardware folks, I put this up there for you. I put these little sheets underneath it for me. There's the photomultiplier tube at the beginning, and then it's basically a pulse amplifier, a pulse normalizer, and then outputs to the data processing. That's the most I'll get on that picture because that's the most I understand of it. Um, I won't get into the details of how pulse pileup works, but basically there's three types of pulse pileup. There's peak pileup, tail pileup, and this like dead time distortion pileup. You would expect the pulse to look like this pink one. Uh, one photon comes in, you get this nice pulse. Um, but after four downward counts, it says, I've seen four downward counts. If I go back four counts, that's where the peak is. And then I'm not going to look for another 27 counts. And then I'm ready to detect another photon. That's how long it should take. Well, what if, bless you. Thank you. Well, what if you get a photon, you know, you have three downward counts. And then you get another photon, it goes back up again. Well, it's going to measure those two photons together as one single photon, and the energy is going to be wrong, and your photon, photon count is going to be wrong. Or what if it's after those four counts? I say counts, it's, it's, a, it's a hardware frequency. But after those four, I'm going to use the word counts again. Um, it stops looking for 27. It's just, I'm waiting 27 counts later, and then I'm ready to detect another one. What if you get a photon within there? You're going to miss it. And it's going to take longer to return back to baseline. So if you get another photon after that, the baseline's lower. So your energy for that photon is going to be lower. Or in this tail pileup, it's ready to detect another photon, but it hasn't quite returned to the background level yet. So the energy is misrepresented. So I had to decouple this and decouple all of these, these photons. And this is just of order one. With an event this bright, it went up to order eight, which is a lot of computation time to try and correct. And we do this with the, the spectral fitting model, where you assume a spectrum, 
you fold it through the detector response and you get out these, these spectrum counts. And what you usually do is you know this distortion step and you compare the counts with this input spectrum to the measured counts. And then you would adjust the input spectrum. And eventually you would converge the maximum likelihood to this representation of the spectra gives you out the counts that you see. Well, we need to do a distortion step. So these counts come out, we distort them and compare the distorted estimated distorted counts to the measured distorted counts. I can get more into it, but I'm not going to bore you guys. It's, it's very complicated. But basically, this is what we get out. We know it's not perfect. We assume the band function because we fit the band function everywhere else. So we're just going to assume a band function in this case. We're not going for perfection, but we're trying to get the energy of this thing. Is it really the boat? Is what we want to know. So assuming a band function, these are our residuals. They're not perfect. We know that. We don't claim they are. But they are good enough to get the total energy. So this is after pulse pilot correction, how bright we estimate it to be. It dwarfs everything else. It is bananas how actually bright this event is. And we're confident in these results because we are able to measure a fluence, peak flux, EISO, and LISO. And four other instruments were all saturated. CONUS, PRB Alpha, Insight, and GCAN. They all did their own independent pulse pilot correction to get the total energetics. All, their four values and our values are all consistent with each other to an order of energy. That's fantastic. So we're all pretty confident that these are correct numbers. Now, if we put these in comparison with all other GRBs that GBM has seen, I want to point your attention to this fluence one. You think Peter Veras put this one together. It's crazy. In 15 years, if you take all of the GRBs other than this one and add their fluence together, this one event is more than twice as much fluence. That's crazy. You've seen like over 2,000 GRBs. That's truly insane. I mean, it's an outlier over here. It has three of the four measures of brightness. And for LISO, it's the second highest in our sample. And then Eric Burns took this. Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. That's fine. Eric Burns took this a step further. And instead of just GBM over 15 years, he went through the entire history of GRBs back to um, the Vela satellites. 55 years of data and put this into perspective to see if this really is the brightest event of all time. Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. Um, it's the highest peak flux influence. It's EISO dwarfs everything else. And the second highest uh, is about 50% of its intrinsic energy, which is crazy. And the LISO is the third highest ever recorded. Um, but it's in the 99% bar. So this really is the boat. Mm -hmm. Eric Burns also, you know, he used the um, the log and log S scale basically to estimate how often should we see this thing, like a recursion rate basically. And he extrapolates this down. Um, you would expect to see an event like this once every 10,000 years. That's Ridiculous. So the last time this event went off statistically predates the invention of human brain. We were extremely lucky to see this thing. So that's my whole talk. I hope this excited you guys because this event is bananas bright. And I'm just gonna leave you with it in all its glory compared to the you can't even see the fourth one. <laughs> I just noticed that. Then it's yeah. That's my talk. If you have questions, I have backup slides. Yeah. Um, one good question. Do you have a counterpart? Um, a counterpart, as in optical? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, you can. That's how we got the redshift. Okay. Yes, it was measured through a hex galaxy, like the equals. Point one or something.
the question was, is this the brightest because it's so close or is it the brightest because it's intrinsically the brightest? And the answer is both. Like we just got really lucky. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes, it is. Um, this is maybe a naive question, but do you have any sense of what creates this spectrum? Um, I think if you can answer that, that'd be great. Uh, no one, <laughs> uh, Bill Pachase has had a really great quote. He said, if you show me one gamma ray burst, I'll show you one gamma ray burst, meaning that they're all different. It's hard to categorize them. Okay. They're very stochastic. So why? Why is it so much more powerful than all the others? Is there something wonderful about the wolf ray star that does this? Uh, no, it's theorized that wolf ray stars are, you know, make four collapse supernova that it, uh, that produced GRBs. It's still the verdict's still out as to like what it was about this. Was it the atmosphere around it, or just the, I guess. The galactic atmosphere around it. I don't. I have no idea. Um, I think the the jets and the GRBs are the problem here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, there's a nice paper that I have seen to have seen for Connor. I think it's the first author on structured jets. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on the structure, which we don't understand, everybody agrees. Um, <clears throat> one can get. Uh, much more reasonable as to use that word uh, total energy. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Have you all thought about that in response to that paper? Um, I personally have not. Mm -hmm. I can ask the theorists that I've worked with about it. I'm sure they mm -hmm. thought about it, but I mean, even with 170817, jet structure is a really um Big issue. It's, yeah, it's a difficult topic to, to tackle with top hat jets or Gaussian, whatever you want to do. Structured jets just make structured jets are probably the most complicated. So, mm -hmm. uh, basically, same question was slightly different angle. So, the lectures don't show the chromatic uh, value, which uh, in the models from man generates to the beam. So, is there an upper limit to the angle or uh, mm -hmm. the value which you talking about? Um, I have that in the paper. I forget. Is this the laser Uh, yes. I think. Because the total energy is there's not, not, yeah, isotropic energy. So there's no idea of breaking the matter. Not that I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I can follow up with you after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You might have to explain some things to me to understand your question better. Any other questions? Now that suggests the future for of this one because it was very low on the galaxy and so it uh, passed uh, through all the clouds in the galaxy and then I encountered a yeah. cloud it created a beautiful eco of X rays. So yeah. don't check the pictures. They're the really, pictures, they're really speed pictures, good. they're all really good. Yeah. Swift um, too. Yeah, Swift too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. See, they all have some really enchanted um, yeah. really so, nice ones. So let's find out speaker again. No, I'm going to set her up. And move on to the second speaker of today. Um, the second speaker is Li uh, Zhang. Um, uh, she's a third year PhD student at MTD in Germany, uh, where she employs the Yale Zeta Telescope to detect the CGM. Um, her scientific interest focuses. Uh, on the properties of CGM. Down is forward. Um, and it's in play with AGM, uh, galaxies, and the large scale structures. So, um, today we'll give a talk with the title Evolved Super Galaxy Medium in the EOC Hall Sky Survey. Please go ahead to the source. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm happy to share our work about the hot circle medium that we try to detect with the EOC Hall Sky Survey X ray data. So first, oh, okay. so first, the hot CGM that we know there are so many galaxy structures in the universe includes the 
Some have two small tassels close to all gas and there is medium around it, like in the medium, you can handle this there, and they are the gas around the gas phase, and the results are totally related to the gas evolution. For example, it's upgraded to the gas phase from start, and uh, it's recycled from gas to the CDM. Uh, And uh, here we are especially interested in the hot phase of the CDM. It has a temperature higher than 26 Kelvin and it emits X rays for the line emission and sperm spawn. So we want to check it to the X ray particle. There are two heating mechanisms to heat up the CDM. One is the gravitational heat of radiation gas, and you can see from the Build as we emitted to participate in the energy cluster. And uh, there was also some scaling relation detected even from the X emission to the gas or the gas or to the element of the gas cluster group that people find it steeper than the self similar model, which is a model of the technology for artificial heating. So this brings us the second negative mechanism of the gas, which is the feedback. Either from the agents or the stellar population in the country, it takes and ejects the hot gas to the CDM. So, in general, the hot CDM which contains the information about the gas evolution and how it's uh, modulated. That's what we want to study. There was already many works using the X ray telescope to detect the hot CDM, like, for example, using SMM or Chandra to detect the look at the very nearby natural gases and the actual emission from CDM can be detected out to about 100 to 200 kilopascals. And uh, but the small problem is if you look it into the visual region, if it's exactly that the whole CDM is expanding, you can see we only look at the, the inner part of the telescope. So there are still many things that we don't know that we want to figure out. Later, there is also you people using the local telescope, which, which is uh, another X ray outside survey telescope that it has scanned the sky and also in a new short time, about 300 seconds for the sky. You, we know that with this shallow CDM, it's not possible to detect the oxygen from one density. So, this brings up a method called the stacking. So, the stacking is we can take you know, make use of the gas signal from the flowing other than optical or X ray. For example, this is a star map with the rectangles denoting all the different gas flowing at different part of the sky with different uh, solid gas. And then they will get the position similarity and also the state of the similarity. Then we can use the spectrum to estimate the properties of galaxies like the redshift stuff. Uh, stellar map of lava matrix that we can use to build some interesting gas examples, and we got to some all the explanations around all these galaxies to obtain enough signal to noise to detect the whole CDM emission. And that is what Anderson did with the Yoka data. Here is an image after stacking 20,000 galaxies with the stellarized signal to the Milky Way, and the black color is the signal to God. And if we look at the at the surface surface spot belt, it's the data point here. You can see in below we got the signals at the center, and then it kind of extend to about 200 kilopascals, but still quite noisy. But they indeed integrate all the X-ray emissions within the R500 and try to get a scaling relation between the X-ray luminosity to the stellar mass and to see that uh, this is related to the gas population and how it's uh, related to the gas evolution. And you can see they have very nice measurements for massive galaxies, but uh, again, when we go to the Milky Way lab or like the uh, M31 lab galaxies in Stellar the signal is still not uh, good enough to draw some conclusions. So this brings up the questions like we still don't know how bright or expanded the CDM around the Milky Way galaxies, and we don't know how the hot CDM relating to the gas population, and uh, also what the, uh, what is the detection speed on the gas evolution models? Because you can see that there are many simulations 
that they are trying to predict the hot gas mass fraction at the different channel mass, and it's very scattered at the lower mass galaxy. And there, in this work, we are trying to answer the first question <laughs> with the actually textual hero data. So hero data is uh, like a recently launched, not recently, like launched at 2019, and it has a much better density than the rupet, and it has a uh, a large effective area. It has been for around uh, four strikes away, and that reached a median explore time of 500, uh, about 700 seconds. And this is a scan net here. And it has uh, did uh, two data releases. So we will use this X-ray data and uh, we apply the setting method to the spectroscopy design. So the other version of the settings is the gas sample. And I would say the gas sample is actually the most important part in the setting experiment. It's like a liquid within the gas sample comparison. It will cause the value of the result. So the basic Two three areas of a mass gas sample is first is large enough to have enough signal, and it has to need to be highly sampled. We don't want to introduce some selection bias at the very beginning of the sample building. So we consider that the galaxy catalog a survey of the snow one that one, it has a kind of large overlap that area with the Euro gas sky, and it has if uh, the surveys are deep enough, so we can go for higher density, and also we can obtain a higher number of sensors to stack. And also there is uh, the estimate of the uh, redshift of this galaxy. And the next thing we need to be careful is that we should only stack the visible ones. This is, if you look out to the sky, there are the galaxies distributed over the sky. There are the central galaxy, which is the most massive galaxy within the segment cycle, that is, it can dominate the emission within it. And there is also the satellite galaxy, nearby central galaxy within the segment cycle. And then it's probably might be affected by it. And also, when we look out and try to stack all the foreground the background emission, we might count the emission which is belonging to more massive central galaxy to the satellite which then caused the boost of emission in the wrong direction. So this is what we need to be careful to stack only single galaxy and to identify the single galaxy accurately. We need to have a very nice estimation of the redshift of the galaxy. So we can always get this part together and which one is the central. So in summary, we decide to use the Sloan survey, which is a uh, spectroscopic redshift. We, in our work, we are actually trying to build some isolated galaxy set that is like selected very strictly. And as a result, we got a bad example, but it's uh, a clean and this example, and we plan to do a test, but I will not present it here. And the third thing method is uh, it will be nice if we also the carbon plate of the galaxy, and we also have data for the different galaxies. So it's easier to model the emissions from the end or HDL or XRB, then we can get the uh, model to the CDM emission. So the test catalog we are using is the Snow Gal 7 and the Galaxy samples. The orange area is, is overlap with the Eurobita sky. And we are looking at the galaxies with stellar mass ranging from 10 to the 10 to 10 to 11 to 5. We build a volume limited galaxy sample. So we think this maximum redshift is the galaxy with the above 95% complete. There is less selection bias. And we use the recently updated Google standard developed by Tinker to identify the central galaxies. And in total, we got about 85,000 central galaxies, distributed galaxies. And then we start to stack. So we developed our own stacking code. But instead of using the X-ray data reduction particle data, because that is more time-consuming. But the logic is very similar. So we retrieve the events around the galaxy, and we estimate the conversion factor from the counter rate to the flux based on the energy of the event, the effective area, the spur time, or the absorption correction. And then we sum up all the emissions around galaxies with the average and we got the result. 
We take the background beyond our biohazard, like for example, this data point are the vaccine seeking molecules, and then we take the background around here, which is, uh, yeah, quite a average result uh, background, on the local background. And uh, we can see that the accuracy comes from not only the point error, but also the depth of response. This is uh, a repeated setting such that not only it has been tested and the uh, confidence standard deviation, this is a method to estimate the accuracy introduced by the setting tester. And then we, oh, uh, after all this procedure, we get the success value profile of the actual minimum significant health effort. And in our work, we only focus on one and a half times of my job to this video. And now we have the result. So here is the actual surface primary profile. Uh, for mu 3 mass galaxies and PO2 and PO1 mass galaxies, which is uh, denoted here. And the data points and the actual emission are summarized in all the data from the actual sources and also our data tested the local background. But all, which is also over plotted is the dotted line, which is a point spread function of PO2. So by comparison, you can clearly see that we get something pretty out to about the viral radius, which is the vertical line here, around the mutual mass galaxies or massive galaxies. And this is, a, 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 I would say, a large step forward, because before we can only uh, detect the image out to about 20 kilobytes, and now we can go much further away. And uh, notice that uh, here, although we must have actual sources, but there are still unresolved sources, and the next step, we build the models to remove it. So namely, we consider the unresolved agents and the actual binary emissions in the central galaxies with depth. And we also consider that when we look out to the river radius, the point sources in the satellite galaxies or galaxies with also for some communication, and we also try to model it. And also with that action galaxies, there might be some more misidentification, and we might also like to select some or some satellite test drive, and we also consider that also. And uh, in summary, we consider the contamination from a gas of in central in satellite and the mid-class by the satellite. And sum them up, we have the contamination. And we subtract this from the spectral signal, and we got the hot CGM emission surface primary profile. You can see we can clearly explain to a type of our real radius for massive galaxies. We use a beta model to, de to describe each surface binary profile, and we measure the beta value ranging from 0.27 to 0.40. So this is, is the first time that we can manage to measure the beta model, uh, measure the surface binary uh, of CGM all the way to the viral radius with the beta model itself. And this value actually is quite close to it, it's a pretty well based on the motion uh, observations at the lower and the inner region. So, with this surface primary profile, we are thinking, okay, let's estimate the variable mass of this hot CGM. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't have the measurement of the temperature or motility, so we just make some assumptions. And then we calculate the parallel fraction of hot CGM plus the scalar mass divided by the river mass. And then it's all these points here with different assumptions of lower temperature. And if I find something interesting or Build a normal is like uh, the very function increases with the decrease in scalar mass, which is uh, very fast. Then, if we look at the simulation, we check it, and it seems that TNG or some simba simulation they also predict this increase of uh, variable fraction, and uh, it's attributed to some defect models that we use. But uh, for like a more detailed discussion, we need to do it for further work because we either need to have a better picture of temperature and also we need to figure out what feedback introduces this abnormal behavior. Okay, then with the surface primary profile, we move to the scaling region. Like we call the extra emission within about a half hundred radius related to the scalar mass of the galaxies. And our measurement is this purple data points. For comparison, we also plotted the measurement using the local spectrum, which is all the brown data points. And uh, you can see at lower mass galaxies, our measurement has much better signal to noise compared to previous work for large improvement. And we found a broken point of the we are described as a scaling region. 
We also compared our results to the different missions, and you can see all these dashboards to the line. And uh, we found that the Matthew Galaxy, the same year seen by upgrades did well. Yeah. And uh, but uh, the people simulation data all estimated. But at lower mass galaxies, all these simulations are kept together away from the operation, which means that our operation might be able to produce uh, provide some new constraints on the simulation or the simulation model. So the next step we want to do is uh, we want to study the relationship between the CDM technology and the LOM. It is because like the, it's always been done in, at the galaxy cluster of both nodes. We want to see, okay, what is for the galaxy? And we can do it because the hello map is made or sum to each galaxy by the both data of the Bayesian score. So we build another galaxy sample, being the HGP for the hello map, and also model limited, and we repeat the procedure of stretching galaxies to measure the surface brightness profile and to model the CDM emissions. <laughs> and then we got the scaling relations between x minus 3 to the hello map galaxy. The couple data points are our measurements, and the ground data points are all the previous measurements of galaxy clusters of groups. And you can see our measurements have nicely uh, extended the scaling ratio to even lower hello. And we got a slope of about zero over the curve. It's like a little shallower than the more massive cluster. And then indeed, we also, again, compared to the simulation. And we found something like before, the ego predicts two bright has been missing at the high mass end, but now it seems it agreed. Then we checked the scalar to hello mass relation of the observation, which is a gray band, and the different simulation. We found, oh, the ego, it indeed thinks the, the in the same dark matter hello, it thinks lower, uh, mass, lower mass galaxies are really uh, result in. It causes this uh, somehow deviation. So therefore, we are thinking, let's see what is, what if we can roll out scaling relations of this scalar mass, uh, actually we want to say hello mass relation to the scalar to hello mass relation in our galaxy sample. And then we found, oh, there is a closed loop that uh, if we derive the scaling relation by signing up the scaling relation between actually we want hello mass and scalar to hello mass relation, we get a consistent consistent result of our previous measurement, that's the way the different light scatter, which is due to the scatter from the uh, this relation. So this brings up the question that uh, when we are when we were comparing the scaling relation to the simulation, we have to consider all the dark energy because it's all related. And uh, yeah, this is the key. And we need to build a like a more general picture to understand our result. But uh, so because it's hard to draw some conclusion from the simulation comparison, what we did something else is to compare to the self-similar scenario. It was the gravitational only scenario, which was broadly used in the cluster scale to see oh there is agent setback needed. So we also all plotted the self-similar scenario at the lower mass end uh, side, which is the blue line here. You might notice they have different slopes at different values. And this is because self-similar predicts the, the actual luminosity is related to the emissivity, and the emissivity is related to the real temperature of the cluster. As a result, the emissivity itself is uh, dependent on the temperature because there is a gram strong emission at the highest temperature and the line emission dominates at the lower temperature. But after all, we found that for lower mass galaxies, our overall scaling relation has a very close uh, similar slope to the self-similar scenario. Then this brings the uh, like uh, idea like, will this mean that the big data and the lower mass galaxies they had a very less prominent influence on the CDM luminosity, which might be true because if you look at the scalar to hello mass relation again, it's uh, the peak of the ratio is around this uh, yellow area. But both people think the agent effect method uh, uh, below people think the self effect method. So indeed, we are reaching an area where the feedback mechanism is uh, less dominant. So in general, yeah, uh, uh, we can have some more 
testing on the API model of the integration and all the and I don't have time to go through this. And I will go through summary therapy. So in our work, we measure the OCDM more emissions by using the user data, by building a nice gas example carefully. We successfully measure the surface cost of OCDM and use the user data for the field, which is very nice. And we also started uh, started to study the scaling relations between the future development for low and galaxy to constrain the galaxy model models. Also, we found this brings we did a lot, but there are, uh, it also brings a lot of more questions, like uh, we, how do we interpret the brain of fraction of them, and we need to build a demo picture of the alien relation and the scale of the relation, and uh, the, how to integrate the efficient processes, and uh, yeah, I don't know. So this is uh, what we did, and uh, yes, looking forward to comments or questions. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering if you could say something more about um, when you were comparing to some of the simulations, for example, mm -hmm. how did you select the simulation sample that you were using? Oh, you mean the galaxy zero? Yeah. Like, were you trying to do that in a similar way to how you've done it in the observation? Oh. How did you then make them make the extra? So, it really is a, that's a, that's a very simple question. The galaxy is at least and that's the evaluation. Okay, and how, and how did you calculate the extra? Oh, it's uh, just uh, take the and uh, apply the uh, model on it and about the activity. Oh, purple. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work we have done with the, the stacking. That's, that's great. So hopefully we don't, you know, at least we did, I'd like to see that compared into the old, the old that stacking, because I understand how you get all the same rates. Uh, but there's, so, I mean, there are a lot of questions, but the first, 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 let me ask a couple of questions. One, uh, stacking is good to have the overall picture, but when you come here with the local galaxy, which are exactly right, when we can even distinguish all the different uh, sources, like the point source, AGM, or the gas, and so on. When you compare those, uh, have you done that, by, by the way? Uh, there are a lot of scan rates already done with the local galaxies, and we yeah. probably have to cover yeah. that. And the, the, my impression is, like a certain brightness, profile may be better than the one locally determined because you have to subtract all the agent portion near the center area. So that's one thing. Uh, probably I can get those to you later. So yeah, you, you may want to compare with the uh, already known uh, various relations determined with the local values. Yes. And another question is probably you cannot do it, but your redshift limit is goes like a 0.2. So you cannot actually say anything about the redshift chain and the dependency. Or mm -hmm. can you? For the actually that thing will go to 0.4, but for at least we did the we didn't see the redshift limit. But we can study more on the So, can you very handle your talk with flash, the slide, yeah. uh, or picture about star forming and quiets and galaxies? Uh -huh. So, can you just show that real quick? It seems to me that star forming and quiets and galaxies, yeah, they seem to be very similar in terms yeah, of energy, which, very, which is opposite of what PMD or EGO simulations are predicting. You can comment on that. Yeah. So, namely, we are stacking the galaxies in the heaven tree. It's just because the big bands are completely like a uh, higher mass and mass element so compared to the star forming. Then if uh, uh, if you explain me and we were stacking the galaxies, we couldn't figure out which reason might cause the difference in the oscillation point in all galaxy we encountered. And we found if we do this, the hidden and star forming galaxies they have no difference uh, in that emission. It means the element is the dominant parameter of the actual emission. That is, uh, uh, we think, uh, 
Any other questions? If not, let's find both speakers again. And see you not next week, but the one after. <laughs> <laughs>